Carlson, we made the point, or made the point many times that this guy has incredible capacity as a propagandist. And there has been times where because so few actual issues are covered on cable news to do with working class issues, with general issues of, of declining fortunes, deindustrialization, um, and that Carlson, uh, because he will speak to those things and then spin them. Um, and I want to be really clear, not only in xenophobic and racist directions, which he undoubtedly does, but also in ways that again, reveal that this right-wing populism thing can never actually fundamentally lead anywhere because these guys are not saying, okay, what can we, can de- what can we correlate all of these declining prospects with? The destruction of the labor movement. What do we know historically is the main vehicle that whether it's the New Deal or various advances globally in social democracy, what fundamentally is the agent of that? Organized labor is always there. And you don't ever hear Steve Bannon and Tucker Carlson or any of these people talking about that. And incidentally, their project of bigotry and division is antithetical to building that movement capacity, which definitionally is broad, multiracial and multi-identity because the working class is in fact that. And, you know, now he's, He has an opportunity to play to a deranged base with the Black Lives Matter protests, but it, it, it really underscores his, his inability to effectively carry out the propaganda beyond that base. Right. And so here he is um, basically just talking a bunch of nonsense about the protests. And this is interesting. This is another very interesting right-wing trope. It's either, you know, they're at the gate, civilization is over, the protests are all consuming and all powerful and they're terrifying, or people risking their physical well-being to stop police murder and brutality, and maybe even in an incredibly positive way, reimagine crime and punishment in this society. That are just morons, according to Tucker Carlson. Our country. At times it's been depressing, but it seems important. At this point, it's pretty clear that nothing is what we're told it is. These are not protests. This is not about George Floyd. It's not about systemic racism, whatever that is. America is not a racist country. You are not a bad person for living here. These are definitely not protesters. They're not even rioters. They're the armed militia of the Democratic Party. They're working to overthrow our system of government. They're trying to put themselves in power. That's all obvious now. It's genuinely sinister. We're worried about it. We've said that. We mean it. But in the process of saying that, we may have missed something else that is also true, as well as highly amusing. These people are idiots. For real. The angry children you watch set fire to Wendy's and topple statues and scream at you on television day after day are truly and utterly stupid. There's probably never been a dumber group gathered in one place in all of American history. They're mouth breathers. They know nothing. They couldn't tell you who George Washington was. They don't know when the Civil War was fought. Probably not even to the century. So I I could think of a group of guys who went to the Michigan State House with machine guns and had, uh, you know, Nazi paraphernalia in some cases and had a massive fucking tantrum uh, because there was an attempt to stop the spread of a pandemic, a once a hundred year pandemic. I can think of that. And, you know, this is, this is something though, there's a lesson here too, for social media. You can find examples and some of them I think are just a hundred percent fake and staged. And some of them, yeah, there's you, anytime there's mass groups of people, you can find stupid nonsense and there is absolutely stupid nonsense uh, at these protests. And that's all they're going to ride off of. But the main fundamental things, he's completely like, the demands are absolutely clear. 
The demands are totally antithetical to the mainstream leadership of the Democratic Party, which will try to cynically twist them. Joe Biden's prime response to this so far has actually literally been, we're going to increase investments in police departments for safety and other upgrades. People are out on the streets talking about defunds, talking about abolishing, talking about various deep structural changes, and also really concretely redistributive measures in municipalities. And I will tell you that knocking down the statues of Confederates and other, if you want to use the parlance of an idiot like Tucker Carlson, let's say anti-American terrorists, absolutely show a knowledge base in U.S. history. Yeah, I can assure this is- you of that. I can assure you of that. Why, why else would somebody have a fixation? If you didn't know, then you wouldn't know. Tucker knows who the idiots are, and it's the people who say and are are seeing this on their TV. They're yelling at you yep. on your TV, uh, right. right? Like he knows that they're insulated from all this stuff, and he's just going to keep appealing to that. But the amazing thing is, I, it shows a side of weakness that he has to um, poison the well so thoroughly like this. Like not only are they extremely dangerous, but they are stupid and don't look for anything in the content of what they're saying because you'll be wasting your time. Exactly. And let's take like random examples of somebody saying something dumb or doing something dumb or let's, and this is the other thing, he is going to zero in on the human resources, like sort of discourse. And there's a great piece in the bellows I, that's actually uh, written by uh, a friend of show, a uh, friend of MR and friend of TMBS, um, Damn it. I wish I could find this. I should, but it's a, it's an incredible critique. It's called something. I think the title is I'm black and afraid of white fragility. And it's a critique of that book that is making the rounds. Um, It's yeah. I'm black and I'm afraid of white fragility by Cedric Michael Simmons. And his example, he says, sort of like really, really important points about D'Angelo's book. Um, And uh in, in, including like, you know, anti-essentialism points, also really measuring the effectiveness of, uh, okay, yeah, let's scroll down a little bit though. There's, there was something I wanted to, to quote in it down further. Sorry, I just need, I should have thought of this before. Um, down further, down further. Right, see, um, Right fragility reinforces the belief the responsibility for racism lies with individual worker attitudes and invisible phenomenon. But then it it goes on to explain, he goes on to explain basically like if I was an employer, I would love nothing more um, than basically to have a conversation that's purely about the personal attitudes of my employees and not our hiring practices where we stand in society, how we distribute resources, and who sits basically at the, at the top of the power structure. And so there's this really brilliant and really important critique, and Cedric Johnson's making it, and others who are really serious about actually tackling um, racism and policing and all the redistributive questions that surround that. And so what Tucker does is he takes like these random things that are going to get amplified in corporate America and in mass culture because they don't go. um, And and look, some of them are necessary and some of them are positive, but they are not systemic and they are certainly not responding to demands you hear on the street. And he's going to just say like, okay, that's just all the same thing, right? Like some book that is written for corporate training seminars that has nothing to do with urgent systemic demands about police now and prison now. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. And he is a master of cynically taking one type of buzzword, um, misapplying it to huge movements, and then demonizing and distorting them from there. But I agree with you, Matt. I think that this is, I think this is weakness. I like, I don't think, I think that there have been other times where he has been able to catch like a trend of say like American dissatisfaction with 
corporate power, inequality, whatever, and or discussed with elites, all real, organic, and broadly distributed things, and then twist it to um, his bigoted agenda. This one, I mean, partially, obviously, because definitionally he has to, because of where he is, he has to deny the reality and the validity of what people are demonstrating against. That's, that's number one. So he can't, he doesn't have the same room to maneuver. So he's kind of just reduced. I mean, he is just another Fox news host, but he's usually putting something different on the table, which is why he's more interesting and more dangerous and takes me to almost, figure out, but he's just, I mean, it's all just basically the same bullshit with this. It point. didn't even seem like he was writing this one. No. Like it seemed like it, this was a staffer written one. Like, yeah, there's dummies. I don't know. It, it seemed no, totally. it very pathetic, really. Totally. It's pathetic. And it's like, and it has nothing to do with, and you know, and also that's why I like, yeah, it has nothing to do with like, you're a good person or a bad person. Like, what are you talking about? Like, this is about, and then to just go and say like, I mean, I could, uh, people are calling for the tearing down of Confederate war generals and other great criminals in U.S. history. I could assure you they know who George Washington is. Like, if you know the specificity of some, at, like, because I, I hear about statues getting torn down. I had no idea who this or that Confederate general was. It's how right? I learn about a lot of the history. Actually. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, yeah, the only reason, yeah, I guess I'm a moron because the only reason that I know about a lot of these obscure, disgusting figures that are honored, by the way, that we should always mention this, not even in a place of continuity. Like, even if you, that argument is stupid in and of itself, but these were not monuments that were built during the time. These weren't like, oh, we just fought a war and let's let's get those monuments up. This is part of the construction of the Jim Crow South to create imagined past and justify an apartheid system. It's a modern creation. Uh, there isn't any actual historical groundedness to it one way or another. You know, these, these guys are so disgusting because they'll move in between like, oh, why should you, why should you take down someone who, uh, you know, owned slaves and someone who fought against, you know, fought to, to, to preserve the antebellum system. Uh, and then in the next breath, it's like, oh, well, you know, I mean, you keep open concentration camps to remember the history. Well, okay. it's funny. It's okay. funny. Like also the, the another sign of weakness is the rhetorical move they make where they always make this about people like Washington or Lincoln, right? Not, not just gloss over the fact that we have all these Confederate statues still up. Um, but they make it about Lincoln. And then you actually look at the Lincoln statue, for instance, that's being protested. And it's like Lincoln with like a slave at his feet, like rising up. And he's like benevolently like guiding him on his like right. rise to like full civilization. Like, yes, that shit should be torn down. Let's replace it with a good one of like yeah, abolitionists or something. Like, yeah. But we, and we could, and of course we could keep an honor Lincoln. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, I do look, I agree right. with the complexity. Like, I'm sorry. Like, look, like, no, you can't. Not everything is going to be filtered through 2020 standard. And, and I thought the one around grants actually opened up like a very serious and interesting debate. And I don't, you know, like I, I always am going to shy away from the sort of like one dimensional, but like, that's exactly the point that you just said there too. It's like, it's not Lincoln. It's the fact that there is a supplicant slave at his feet. It's not a, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not Lincoln and Frederick Douglass standing side by side. It's not uh, a yeah, representation conversing of as that. equals. Conversing <laughs> as equals. It's not a representation of that. It's it's thank you so much. I mean it's it's disgusting. It's, but it's not the Lincolnness that makes it disgusting. It's the supplicantness, it's the ben beneficence that makes it absolutely disgusting. And that takes, by the way, some uh some intelligence and historical insight to uh, to parse. I hate to say it, Tucker. Um, let's do one more. Don't topic. they know that George Washington was the guy who didn't chop down the cherry tree? <laughs> <laughs> now they want to chop down cherry trees. They want to chop down cherry trees. Uh, this is another interesting Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson, it, it's very, you know, the beginning of Corona, you definitely had people from right-wing outlets who took it really seriously. And they took it seriously because they wanted to use it in an ongoing propaganda war against China. 
So if you were listening to Steve Bannon's podcast in January, you would have heard more about Corona uh, than many other outlets. And it was inseparable from this drumbeat of trying to aggressively start absolutely in that sense, a a cold war with China, um, potentially even worse. Um, And so the story was that Tucker Carlson went to Mar-a-Lago. He convinced Trump that this was real and action needed to be taken. It's good that he said that again, though, the reporting, like it's, it's giving Tucker way too much credit. I mean, again, the definitive piece on Trump and COVID is Edward Luce's piece in the financial times. And there were multiple people around him who expressed concern and alarm about this. Jared didn't want to react to it because it might be bad for the stock market. And of course, you all know what Trump was most interested in listening to in terms of personal, you know, in terms of the advice of like, Oh, this is really serious. But, but Jared says it might be bad for the stock market. So I think we know which way I'm going to go in that. And it wasn't until, I mean, basically it became something that he perceived as a political threat. Right now, Tucker ends up changing his tune on that. Uh, relatively quickly. And so even as like Sean Hannity is covering his ass and being like, Ooh, maybe I shouldn't have called it a flu. um, Tucker ends up going along. In fact, the interview months ago with the Texas Lieutenant governor suggesting that older people should sacrifice their lives. So the economy can keep going. That was done on Tucker's show. So here he is saying that the lockdowns were proved unnecessary and government officials, I wonder who they are, because that's more demonization of uh, Fauci, would be my guess, were lying to us. But we do think it's worth, for a minute, taking a pause to assess whether or not they were in fact lying to us about the coronavirus and our response to it. And the short answer is this, yes, they were definitely lying. As a matter of public health, we can say conclusively the lockdowns were not necessary. In fact, we can prove that. And here's the most powerful evidence. States that never locked down at all, states where people were allowed to live like Americans and not cower indoors alone, in the end turned out no worse than states that had mandatory quarantines, the state you probably live in. The state- I don't, I don't even understand. I, I, I don't understand what he's pointing to here. New York had the worst of it out of the gate. And there's no doubt, obviously, that it's a global a, city. It's a global city. People live in much closer uh, quarters to each other. So that's going to be at a heightened risk. In fact, uh, the only thing per capita that is higher than New York City that, that you're more likely to get COVID in, and Donald Trump has helped this greatly by protecting his friends in the, uh, in the, in the ag industry is if there's a meat packing plant that those are huge, huge vectors for COVID because of how unsanitary and disgusting those plants are and how abused those workers are. And the CEO of one of the uh, conglomerates said that social distancing is for people that work with computers. I just put Arizona, Texas, and Florida are skyrocketing, right? Yeah, now. and they're going to surpass New York without any sort of mitigation coming from their government leadership in each state. Right. And this was just two weeks ago that he said this. So, like, oh, he said this two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah, June yeah. 10. Okay. Yeah. So, whoops. Bullshit. Whoops. And this doesn't even, uh, you know, go back to the Columbia study. Uh, that suggests that I think about 30,000 lives could have been saved. I think it was as much as 30,000 if the shutdown had gone into place a week earlier. Which, like, it could have because I was aware that we should probably... Be, I remember, I tweeted some, or Instagram, but some say go the fucking side, like a week before de Blasio was taking it seriously. It's like, this was, and I'm not saying this, like, as I was a genius. I was, I knew about as much as the, the average listener of this show did, right? Like, this was out there in like people were aware of this stuff matt you're a genius 